The next speaker is Professor Vladimir Bulovich. He is Associate Dean for Innovation at the MIT Innovation Initiative. He is a lead of the MIT Nano Project, which we will, he will tell us more about. But it's a fabulous new inv investment in nanotechnology that we're making on campus. He is also a serial entrepreneur. I don't know how much time he will have to cover all of these things in just uh, a short talk for us. But without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Bulovich. And um, he's here to talk about MIT Nano, to talk about some of his innovation activities. And welcome. Well, th thank you. Oh, I have this. That's fine. Uh, that's great. Um, well, so it's a pleasure to be here. I, indeed, uh, ILP is an incredible uh, resource for MIT, as it serves as a bridge in uh, allowing us to expose ourselves to industry, allowing the industry to actually step into MIT and get a very broad view of what MIT can do. Um, I guess uh, as a technologist, and you know, I'm, I'm a professor of electrical engineering. That's uh, my primary mission. My primary usefulness to the world is to make sure I can educate a few students who can step out and change the world because they know a few extra things. And as a university, right, uh, our mission is very well lined up with the missions of companies, meaning our job is not to make profit. Our job is to make knowledge and people. And our currency is impact which means if our people step out into the world and if they succeed because we train them well, that will bring us the next generation of amazing people. They'll say, you know, I want to be just like those MIT alums. So our value, I think, is well aligned with, uh, with what the companies want to do, and that is to say, if we can give you things that you can then go ahead and commercialize, make big, if we can give you people that can transform the big companies or the small companies we can start, we succeeded as an institution, and hence we'll be able to perpetuate MIT's qualities in the years to come. So uh, I guess that being said, that really focuses us on saying, well, what is the key to actually give to our people as they step out of MIT? What are the topics that unify the present vision in the next 20 or 30 years of work? Well, how would I actually find that out is a good question. And from perspective of an academic, maybe the one way to look forward is to ask, what are the youngest of our faculty working on? Because after all, especially those that we tenured, will be around for the next 20, 30 years. So we have already decided that they know what the heck they're doing. They are daring, they are innovative, they are thinking about things beyond the bounds of what we have taught the present faculty, hence why we hired them, hence why we recently tenured them. So maybe a good question to ask is, you know, among those individuals, and let me just take a look at the last dozen years. Uh, what do they do? In School of Science and School of Engineering, and those are our two dominant schools at MIT from perspective of research output, right, uh, technical research output. I shouldn't, uh, you know, forget that our Sloan School also does research, but of a different kind. Or our, you know, School of Architecture and Planning does also research, again, of a different technical kind. But the primary places for doing research that I took a look at for School of Science, School of Engineering, well, School of Science is maybe 15%, 10% of our research budget. School of Engineering, maybe three quarters of our research budget. Um, put them all together and say in School of Science, it's about 51% of the recent faculty, more than half, just a bit or more, work on nanotechnology as the key to advancing biology, chemistry, physics, whatever else they're working on. How about School of Engineering? Well, it's about 67% of the recently tenured faculty that work on nanotechnology as the enabler of their advancements. Two thirds. So if I'm gonna look at MIT in a few years from now, uh, it's gonna grow. And you can just see it from the point of view of people we are recently tenuring or people that we are recently hiring. Nanotechnology is the key to being able to move things around and actually build the world as we know it. Um, a good question then to ask, well, well, how come? I mean, you know, isn't nano a thing that was new like 10 years ago? I mean, how come it's new now? <laughs> well, and that's a fantastic question to ask. And then maybe the question would be, actually, you know, nano is a defining property of how we've done things for centuries, not just in the last few years. What happened in 1980s and 90s is we finally had a tool set to see atoms. And that was as flashy as anything can be, right? I mean, after centuries of knowing there are such things as atoms, here you can finally see them. Now, some of us might have forgotten how amazing that moment was, like seeing the first scanning tunnel mic microscope images. But that was a revolution in understanding of how matter truly looks. Up to that point, I mean, 
if you go ahead and look at things like a DNA, you know, it took us about 80 years to figure out the DNA is a twisted helix or that it even exists inside the cell. Sometime in the late 19th century, all the way through the 1950s, we were making guesses, and then someone made a good idea and said it might be a twisted molecule based on this diffraction pattern that was all it was is just a bunch of spots that were diverging from each other. It wasn't an image of a molecule. It was a really good educated guess <laughs> that held up. Today, if I want to see a DNA, I'll tell a student, uh, could you please take that cell culture, extract DNA, here just use these detergents to break the cell walls, spread them on a, a slide and take an STM image of it. And two hours later, I would get a picture and we would look at it and we'd say, oh, it looks like a twisted helix. <laughs> so a day's work uh, that simplified work of 80 years plus. Because we finally have a tool to actually take a look at how things look. And as a result, you know, two decades ago, roughly speaking, when maybe two and a half, when we finally get the, had, had those microscopes kind of working, we started realizing we could start poking nanoscale and investigate single carbon nanotubes and molecules and <clears throat> made us uh, wonder how nanoscale truly operates down on, a, on the nanoscale. That took about a decade, maybe a little more, of marveling. <clears throat> and then uh, recognition that, hey, you know, maybe we can actually use these things in ways that we couldn't do before. And anything built out of physical matter that has not been touched before, anything, indeed takes about a decade to go from the idea to something you can hold in your hand uh, and give to a million people. Now, that number, you can try to dispute me. And indeed, in the age that we live in, which is the software development age, where things can be done in a matter of a year, or you can, as I have recently, upload your El Capitan update on your Mac to make your Mac not work anymore. Uh, <clears throat> that's why I'm not using any slides, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, it, things can happen very, very rapidly from both good and bad. <laughs> um, however, in the hardware world, in the physical world, uh, it takes a while to actually perfect your technology. Uh, and, you know, there are many examples to cite. You can start in the early ages and say, how long did it take to make a zipper from the first patent to the first million boots with a zipper? Well, 1912, the first patent, actually the first patents were like in 1800s, but in 1912, first modern patent, 1925, million boots sold with zippers, right? So that's 13 years. All right, let's move forward. Velcro, how long did Velcro take? Well, you start sometime in 1940s and 50s as an idea of seeing a dog with a burr stuck in his fur and say, oh, can I make something out of it? And then Apollo, well, astronauts essentially kind of modernizing the idea of a Velcro about 12 years from the first use to the, uh, to the actual million people using it. Okay, that's 1950s. How about a little modern age? Well, how many of you guys have uh, Samsung Galaxy phones? Anyone? Yeah, all right. Uh, can you just pull out one of those things? Uh, uh, oh, beautiful. Can you turn on the screen just for me? <laughs> so I am, I am enamored of this screen quite a bit. Uh, so that screen is an organic LED screen. Thank you very much. Uh, and the reason why you probably like that Samsung Galaxy phone is one part is probably the way the screen looks itself. People uh, indeed rave about it because the contrast is so stunning between dark and light. And the, the way it works is that you have about 100 molecules uh, that are making this device known as an organic LED. Now, organic LEDs actually turns out they're 100 molecules thick, but it's the middle 10 molecules that give you the glow that you observe whenever you look at your particular display. Oh, and by the way, uh, you are looking at something like a million pixels, and every one of them has slightly different molecules, right? I mean. There are three kinds of molecules. You need to do reds, greens, and blues, and so they repeat in a periodic fashion. Or you need to pattern the molecules, not just 100 molecules thick, but also a few microns at a pitch in order to make the pixelated structures. Have you ever done that in a history of humanity when it comes to development of active film surfaces? We've done it for Polaroid films, but that was done at a micron scale, not in 100 molecule scale. Oh, and by the way, it's the 10 molecules in the middle, right, that are glowing. I said that. So how do you make something, a technology like that? Well, invention of an OLED, first one is one, was in 1982. Uh, first paper that kind of owned up to the fact was in 1987, and that kind of launched the field. By 1994, guys like me worked in a lab, and we 
uh, made an achievement, tremendous achievement. We extended the lifetime of an OLED from one hour to one month, thousandfold improvement. <laughs> was it the technology? By no means was it the technology. It took till about 1998, an additional work of hundreds, to make it last 100 years and boost the efficiency from a 1% device to 18% external, which means 90% internal efficiency, and then 99% as time went on. Well, could we then make a technology right there and then? Uh, no, no, no. It's uh, 2007, uh, roughly speaking, uh, 25 years from the first invention that you see very low volume displays. Um, a display about this big, 11 inches. For mere $2,500, you can buy yourself one of these. And the reason why you would is because the whole device is one millimeter thick because it's stunning format and stunning image and only quarter VGA resolution. <laughs> but, you know, it looked really good for all of us aficionados of the time. So when does it become real? Well, about 2011, when the first million Samsung units come out. How come they're not bigger? Eh, you know what? It's hard to manufacture. It's very, very hard to manufacture. It's so hard to manufacture that you can buy a bigger one. It's mere $25,000 for a 55-inch screen or thereabout. Why? Because most of the displays you make actually don't look good. And then you, the one that does look good, you can sell, but you need to inflate the price. Why? Because manufacturing process of manufacturing several million pixels at 25 micron pitch and 100, micro, 100 atom accuracy, 100 molecule accuracy, is uh, never been done before. Hardware takes a long time, but OLEDs that are right now in Samsung Galaxy phone command about, what, $20 billion industry of OLEDs? Or thereabout, maybe 10. What's the size that they can grow to? Well, about 120. But what they're missing is manufacturing process. Is there a way to fix the manufacturing process? There are first inklings after about 20 years of work of manufacturing tools that might allow you to do that. So what else can you do? Well, maybe you can make today's LCDs better. And there is a way to do that. How, how to do it is actually through the use of nanomaterials known as quantum dots. When were quantum dots invented? Well, roughly speaking, in 1980s, uh, 1993 or thereabout, the first good quantum dots came about. And first ideas of using them as luminescent sources, roughly in late 1990s. When do you see them as first products? In uh, 2013, by Q Division. Using uh, technology invented about 20 years before but not perfected, not manufactured, not manufacturably made uh, so that you can scale it to a million units. There are several million TVs now that use colloidal quantum dots, and those are the best-looking TVs in the store. And also the other cool thing about them is they don't really increase the price of your LCD screen. They make it last. They make it uh, you know, just a tad more expensive because you're trying to sell it because it's a better-looking TV. The actual cost of the actual unit that you add in is not very significant compared to the cost of everything else inside an LCD, yet is the key to giving the full color gamut, the high color saturation, and a really good color contrast that almost matches or just about matches what OLEDs can do in an LCD format. Are they one millimeter thick? Well, no, they're not. Can they be flexible and foldable like OLEDs can? Not yet. You know, will they ever? Well, OLEDs can do it more easily. And actually, it's expected that Samsung will start giving flexible phones next year uh, as ideas of how can you make OLEDs in entirely new format. So that's the world that I play with. I had a lot of experience uh, in those early days of OLEDs uh, and a company called Universal Display Corporation got formed. Um, that made me believe that nanotechnology can truly be manipulated beyond the bounds of managing silicon, beyond the bounds of managing conventional indium phosphate or gallium arsenide. And led me to say that there's a tremendous amount of opportunity in utilization of nanomaterials that then led me to say, boy, you know, what other nanomaterials can you use beyond molecules? And coming to MIT in uh, 2000, well, in 99, I was interviewing, and I met Muji Bawendi, and saw this vial of glowing dots and said, man, that can be incredible if I could just use that inside an active device. And that led to Q Division. Uh, that indeed allowed us to build, after 10 years, uh, a company that is indeed supplying many, many display manufacturers a transformational technology. In the process of that, after Q Division, uh, we started Cativa, realizing that the other Achilles heel of, of the display industry in OLED world is manufacturing. And Cativa stools from 2008 uh, till 2014, indeed, took us about six, seven years to make printers about the size of this room, 
uh, that manage uh, two and a half by two and a half piece of glass and used, used to print thin films, 100 or 10 molecules thick, to give you high resolution, high fidelity pixelated OLEDs and packaging behind them, allowing them to be flexed and bent without cracking the films. Indeed, for the first time after 20 years, that has been attempted, by the way, in those 20 years intervening by many companies to make similar kinds of tools, but not inspired by understanding of physics or technology that is truly behind, allowed us to make technology that right now, indeed, is being adapted throughout Asia uh, for the manufacturing paradigms. So from perspective of what I gained at MIT as I stepped into this environment, I realized a number of things. One, indeed, today, after my 15 years at MIT, I realized that nanotechnology is the key to enabling the next several decades of advancements. And is it physics, chemistry, material science, electrical engineering, you name it. Uh, every discipline at MIT right now pursues nanotech as the key enabler. The other thing that I realized uh, stepping in is the incredible power of combination of basic physics, basic understanding, and technological development. We use technology as a test bed of physical processes. And knowledge of the, test of the physical processes allows us to improve the technology beyond the bounds of what we've ever done before. Is it by stabilizing OLEDs and making them last from one hour to 100 years? <laughs> or improving their efficiency from a few percent to 100 percent? Similarly, improving the efficiency of quantum dots from looks nice to this is a product. Technologies that we recently developed and we recently launched, uh, solar cell technology based on molecules that are invisible because you choose the molecules that don't absorb the visible light but absorb infrared light and can give you power and hence can be on any surface you touch without you knowing it's there. Or additional many, many, many other technologies MIT offers. Roughly speaking, there are about 2,000 individuals right now working on nanotech uh, at MIT. That's about a quarter of all the grad students and postdocs who are rolling up their sleeves to make their 2,000 projects happen. As partners to MIT, the companies that choose to step into this environment and join us and think through uh, problems with us, are indeed, uh, those companies have an opportunity to see technology that will be relevant and transformational likely five to 10 years from today, not tomorrow. And that's important to realize. Our ability to transform the world is about transforming the future, not transforming the day after tomorrow. And that transformation we aim for is indeed, indeed to allow the world that doesn't consume as much energy, uh, lives much, uh, in much, much smaller carbon footprint. We take very lofty goals. We give them as goals to our students. We know they are nearly impossible, but that's what our students love. Give me a, give me a problem with one miracle. And you know, it's a one good one to give to an MIT student. They'll solve it. So thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you.